prayer for a little bit, and we're going to be focusing on Easter. And today is, of course, uh, Communion Sunday, so I felt it would be appropriate if we talk about the Last Supper and uh, what the meaning of it is, because we we take it once a month in this church. Some traditions have it every Sunday that they meet together. Some traditions have it once a quarter. Um, my last church, we did it once a quarter. Some churches have it once or twice a year. But Jesus did say that when we get together, we are to take the Lord's Supper. And we are communion, Eucharist, um, whatever else you want to call it. Uh, we are to take it so uh, so that we constantly remind ourselves of what Christ has done. In case you're wondering, um, the word Eucharist, I, I looked it up, and uh, we always seem to equate that with uh, Catholicism. But the word Eucharist basically means Thanksgiving. So when you go to a church and they call it Eucharist, you're basically doing a service of Thanksgiving. And then I was curious about what another thing meant, matzah. You know, for our Jewish friends, matzah, uh, it means to be made in haste. So when you hear the word, you see I wrote it down here so I remember it, but if you if you hear matzah bread or matzah balls or something like that, I just like saying that word matzah, something about that. I think a, a chef with a little um, mustache on going matzah, but it basically means bread that is made in haste. And it's a, it's a remembrance of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Israel and Egypt and all that. So what I want to do today is I want to do a little history on communion, and then I want to talk about some of the guidelines which the Apostle Paul gave regarding communion, because we don't talk about that too much anymore. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be looking at that today. And many of you know that the, uh, by the way, kids, if you are filling out the, uh, the bulletins, you do so, but I will tell you, uh, I don't know where the basket is, so I might have to look around for it because we had that musical group here last week, and they, they might have taken the basket home with them. So uh, right after the services, I'm going to run back there, run back here, and see if I can't find it for you. If not, we'll find something for you. But anyway, uh, communion. Communion actually started uh, 1,500 years before Jesus was actually born. It was actually the Passover meal uh, that was given. If you remember, uh, it was the meal in which we were to the, the Israelites were to remember the bondage that they had in Egypt and the fact that God delivered them. And so they were, once a year, they were to gather together as families and they were to have this meal in which they had unleavened bread, which matzah, in which it recognized the haste in which they were to leave Egypt. And then they also had some other things they were supposed to eat, like the lamb, and uh, they were supposed to drink wine and bitter herbs and, and all those things. Uh, last year, we actually had a Seder meal here in the church. We weren't able to do it this year because schedules didn't quite work out. But we had a Seder meal in which uh, Craig was able to go through the entire meal and explain it to us what it actually meant. But, and as I said, it started uh, 1,500 years before Jesus was born. Uh, it remembered the bondage that, we were, that the uh, Israelites were in and their deliverance from Egypt. And, then, and it was remembered to give thanks to God for their deliverance. Many of us don't understand what it means to be a slave. Uh, and when you are in bondage, uh, when there is deliverance, it is a tremendous thing uh, to be free of. The only thing that we can equate it to in our lives now is the, is the bondage of sin. If somebody is bound by sin, and now they are freed from it, uh, it, is, it is just a tremendous, a tremendous uh, weight that's lifted off of you. Because uh, sin it is very binding, and it is, uh, also takes all the resources that you actually have. Then communion. 1,500 years later, Jesus uh, was... Uh, uh, 1,500 years later, Jesus was with his disciples, and he told them that he eagerly desired to eat this meal with them. Now, I was doing some research this past week, and uh, John MacArthur made this comment. He said, Jesus reigned over the last Passover and instituted the First Communion. I want you to think about that. Because when Jesus came and he ate that meal, at that point, a new covenant was actually started 
the, the Passover, the regulations of the Old Testament law were now done, and the Passover essentially was done at that point, and he instituted the new covenant. Covenant actually means, we usually think of covenant meaning contract. And if you think of contract, you're thinking of someone negotiating back and forth. I will do this for you if you do this for me. Uh, I will give you uh, $250,000 for your house, and you will pay me uh, $1,200 or whatever per month back to me. And that's a contract you actually sign. And a lot of times we think of that as a, as a covenant. Somewhat. A covenant is when someone sets the standard and we abide by it. You understand what I mean? There's no negotiating. In other words, Jesus came to this earth, he died on the cross for you, you set up a new covenant, he said, this is the standard by which I have established. You come to this standard versus let's negotiate back and forth. Because if we were negotiating back and forth, what would happen? God, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll just give you my Sundays, and, 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 uh, but the rest of the week is mine. Uh, oh, you know what, I, I will just abide by this part of the Bible instead of this part of the Bible, which we're actually seeing in our society right now. A lot of people are actually doing that. We, we like the fact that the, for God so loved the world, but we don't like Romans chapter 1 that lists what the sins are. So a covenant actually means an agreement, but it means an agreement by which God has established and we agree by, by that. So Jesus reigned over the last Passover and instituted uh, the first communion. And once again, it's remembering the bondage that we have in sin. Okay? When Jesus came, he died on the cross and he freed us from the bondage. Not only do we need to have those addictions of sin, but we can also be free from the fear of sin and death. The bread represents, so Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is given to you. The bread represents the deliverance from sin and deliverance from our own will as well. What? Deliverance from our will? Yeah. What gets us in trouble? Ourselves. Let's be honest. That's what gets us in trouble. Ask Jim when he goes into the jail ministry. How many, how many words I do you hear in the jail? Or me or mine. It's, it's all about me or mine. I have my will, my rights, my way, and, and don't you dare tell me what to do. And we're, and we're also seeing that in the church. And we're actually seeing that in tremendous in the society right now. Don't you dare tell me what to do. Don't you dare tell me what to do. You've been taller in church. So, the bread represents the body. It represents deliverance from sin and deliverance from our own will. The cup actually represents the cross. Because life had to be given so that we could live a life that is of greater value than what we are. And so Jesus came to this earth, never sinned, died on the cross for us. So we have these two elements. You have the body, you have the blood. You have the, 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 the cup of the vine, and then you have the, um, the bread. Now, someone says, well, why don't we drink wine? Well, well, there's a couple things. Jesus said the cup of the vine. And I, I, he did say the cup of the wine. So I think he gave us some latitude in those areas. So grape juice is actually the cup of the vine. We also come from a tradition of um, temperance. And John Wesley, way back in the 1700s, when he was uh, going into the bars and he was saving people, he, he asked himself this question, why should I take communion when I have a, someone who's an alcoholic and I give them alcohol? So that's why some of that has changed a little bit. It's still within it. Maybe it's the fruit of the vine. But does it mean that it's wrong that we that we take communion of this grape juice? No. Does it mean it's wrong that we have some traditions that's actual wine? No, I don't believe it is wrong. I know there's a few times when the grape juice turns here and, and, and we'll have some wine here. It's like, I can always tell the Sundays when, when the when the grape juice has turned a little bit, because I'll listen to all of you. You go like this is the but this is the blood of Christ. We hear this. Everyone <coughs> hear that. It's amazing to hear that sometimes. <laughs> well, anyway, so we take these elements and we take them over and over again to remind us over and over and over and over and over again 
what Jesus has done for us constantly, over and over again. And we need to be reminded of that. Over and over again. It, you know, it's just like the stars and the stripes. What do the stars and the stripes represent? The flag. Lady Liberty. What does that represent? The liberty we have in this nation. Well, how about the Pledge of Allegiance? It's over and over and over, and it's just ingraining in our hearts and our mind what these things represent. The body and the blood of Christ represented by the Matzah. Now we have, it has been instituted by Jesus. Now the church is starting to celebrate. And now we have this church called Corn <coughs> that is meeting together. Corinth was an interesting city. It was a, at that time, it was a really close to the seaport. It's not a seaport city. And if you know that uh, when there's military bases and seaports around an area, it's a, usually a place that a lot of things happen in those areas. I remember when David was in basic training, he said, whatever you do, don't get a hotel at Fort Benning on this street. Because if you do, you're going to stay in your room at night. Okay. So, Corinth was one of those cities. And so you had the church that was established by Paul and Corinth. Paul had left, and then some weird things were happening in the, in the Corinthian church. That basically the church was it was in turmoil. They were, they were some lack of tolerance for each other and everything else. But what was happening was that the Corinthian church would be mad, so they take each other to court. So there's lawsuits that were happening within the court. You had a man that was sleeping with his mother or stepmother in the church, and they were celebrating that, saying, "Oh, we're so tolerant of that." The Lord's Supper had turned into a party because what they were doing is. is it turned into a, a banquet, or it turned into a potluck, where people were bringing their food. But what would happen is, is this side of the church would eat with me, and you guys would go hungry. Or, or maybe you guys were the rich side, and you bring all the food. You bring the lobster and the steak and everything else, and this side would go over here, and they'd be hungry because it's be the poor side. And you go, well, that stuff, we brought our own food. And so they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, and it turned into a feast of dissension. And so the Apostle Paul had to bring some correction to it. It had turned into a very rebellious time. It had turned into a time where, where God was not getting the glory. A time where it was all about me. So the Apostle Paul comes and he says, what I hear is happening. I am not proud of I am ashamed. Because when you come together with the Lord's Supper, there is dissension.